This is Better the Demon You Know. It's a short story about cyberpunk demon hunters. The stench of excrement hung in the air, filling the narrow alley that ended at a large Victorian house. Graffiti tattooed the brick walls, marking the turf of the Migo Nation. Tendrils of mist curled around the fetid odor, and rats and roaches crawled from their recesses and covered the walls and trash bins that lined the alley. The rodents moved in long, sinuous trails as they marched along, their destination the source of recent troubles. Calandra Monroe and Gina Richardson paused and watched the parade, transfixed for a moment, before Calandra broke the silence. It's here, she whispered. <coughs> She'd refused to call Dantalian a hymn. Static charged the air on her arms and back of her neck, forcing it on end. I'll call the others, Gina said. Cal pulled the lavender-scented bandana up to her nose. This feels different, but tell them to hurry. I'll download the blueprints to this house. As data attendant, or DAT, she coordinated the necessary information for each mission, which proved a challenge given that circumstances always required last-minute data gathering. Calandra hitched the blueprints, sent them to Gina, streamed a Latin prayer, banishing and related through the speaker implants in her earlobes. Pressure squeezed her lungs and she had to strain to speak along with the prayer. Dantalian, a duke of hell that commanded 36 legions of demons, had been plaguing the religious order of the Cavaliers of the Del Romo, Ramo del Sang, and the town of Seattle for weeks. Citizens had experienced headaches, malaise, unexplained fevers, and deaths, especially children. Doctors had said a bug was going around the city, but the Cavaliers had, do, had known and dreaded the cause. It's not Ebola. <laughs> <laughs> a breeze blew across Calandra's face, sweeping her hair back. The sound of Gina's frantic voice floated on the upwind, <coughs> then quickly faded as the breeze picked up speed, whirling around the both of them. Calandra kept reciting the prayer, now screaming it into the wind. Lightning crashed down, a single bolt to the ground in front of her, charging the air. Pinpricks of static flowed across her body as she fell backward and slammed onto the pavement. Ozone filled her nostrils. A gust of wind caused her bandana to fly up, and a roach shot to her mouth, followed by more until they overflowed. She rolled over, choking, spitting them out as the rest swarmed in the alley, clinging to her clothes and settling in her hair. Calandra flailed, swatting the bugs off of her, willing herself not to panic. Gina was down as well, and Calandra crawled over to her, fighting against the gale force wind. She wanted to vomit, but she tamped it down until she spat out the last bug. Then they all disappeared, disintegrating before their eyes. Gina called up the house blueprint and shared the display with Calandra. The layout of the first floor lit up in blue in their field of vision. Basement, Calandra said. In many past vanishings, adherence to a cult had built an antechamber in the basement to perform rituals. The basement print came up, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. Not that that meant anything. Homeowners of older houses often added on without filing blueprints with the county. Nothing, Gina said. And as suddenly as it started, the wind stopped. A silence descended, enveloping the scene. Calandra and Jeannie slowly rose to their feet, warily eyeing their surroundings, half expecting a cyclone to sweep them up to the top of the space needle. Another bolt of lightning seared the ether, cracking the pavement about 10 yards in front of them. The crack widened until a large hole swallowed the broken pieces. Dust plumed from the opening, along with a stench that choked Calandra and Gina, leaving them on their knees gasping for air. The smell was palpable, as if the stench from a thousand tombs rose up from the chasm beneath them. Cal grabbed Gina's hand, and they again struggled to their feet. They staggered away from the hole, backward, down the alley. As the air became sweeter, they gulped it in, leaning against the cold brick of the alleyway. Running footsteps echoed, and an arm grabbed up Cal. Tony stood over her, held her for a second, then placed a kiss on her forehead. She breathed in his scent, a sweet savor compared to the tombs. Say it with me, he whispered in her ear. Veni, creator spiritus, mentes tuorum visita. Come, Holy Spirit, creator bless, and in our souls take up thy rest. All the state's cavaliers have been called to banish Dantalian. Hostum repellus longius pacem que donis protinus. Far from us drive the foe we dread, and grant us thy peace instead. All had fasted and prayed for three days. Deo patri sic gloria et filio qui a mortuis surrexit. Now to the Father and Son who rose from death be glory given.
all the kilometers had failed. It had been almost two weeks since the failed banishment, and Tony was still in a coma. Calandra had not left his side, praying for a miracle but getting none. The concilium had called a meeting, which meant either a message had arrived from the Pope, or the Pope's legates themselves had come. In either case, they were about to be on the business end of a <coughs> ruling from Vatican City. Calandra and the others, Ipa Leo, Gina, and Chris, stood in Coventry Hall, dressed in red and black cassocks, ready to file into the meeting in the inner chamber. A checkerboard marble floor stretched out beneath them, ending at the oak wainscoting that led up to green wallpaper, hung with paintings of past cavaliers, swords, crossbows, knives, and zappa zaps filled the space in between. The decor was supposed to highlight the tradition of the secret order and promote a feeling of shared experiences, but all it did to Calandra was put her on edge. As the antique grandfather clock in the hall struck nine, the guards to the chamber doors at the end of the hall drew back their axes and stood at attention. The inlaid wooden doors opened and the cavaliers filed filed in. Two red robed figures entered the room from the hidden recess and Calandra recognized the legates. At the sound of the bell rung by the Cavalier's one initiate, Terry, the small group took their places at the large oval table, along with the legates. A low-hanging crystal chandelier threw angled shadows on the table, which added to the somber atmosphere. As the prey sued, Ippolito sat at the head of the table to lead the meeting, and Calandra noted that even Ippolito seemed tense. Legates Bizzotti and Gisotti sat at the other end of the table. They were not twins, but their matching hair-ringed pates small gray eyes and thin lips made them look as if they had the same parentage. Their personalities, though, were as opposite as day and night. Bizzotti was high strung, wound tighter than a tourniquet. Anyone who dared to cross him would get written up, and they'd all been written up at some point or another. Gisotti was the essence of cool, calm, and collected. Calandra had only seen him angry once, when Ippolito had left a novitiate alone on the dark street while he dashed off toward the action. The novitiate had survived, barely, but had quit the order which meant he had to be killed, and Gisotti had made Ippolito do it. Ippolito stood and opened the meeting with a doxology, doxologia minor. And after the echo of the last amen faded in the small chamber, he sat down. Then, his eyes fixed on the painting of the Pope under which the Cavaliers had been formed, Pope Evaristus, Ippolito began reciting the history. In the death rose of the realm of Satan in the days after Christ's resurrection and the establishment of the kingdom of God, reports of demon possession spread through the land. His Holiness Pope Evaristus determined that these events necessitated a continuous presence of saints dedicated to the destruction of the rule of the prince of this world. Thereby, the Cavaliers de Ramos de la Sang were established in strongholds across the land. This Seattle Ramos, established in 1909, has sworn to defend the citizens of Seattle against the influence of Satan from the time of our initiation until the Lord calls us home. I, Ippolita Puglia, call to order this meeting of the Concilium in the presence of the Cavaliers and the legates of His Holiness. Ippolita wrapped his gavel and sat down. They all waited for one of the legates to speak, which was customary, and Calando, which one it would be, it was Bizzotti. He stood up and stared straight ahead, everyone's eyes transfixed on him. It is my opinion that the Seattle Ramos de la Song has become weak and ineffective due to sin that has been allowed to fester until its vile stench has touched every part of this Ramos. That is why you are unsuccessful in your banishing. The Lord does not answer the prayers of the sinful. Therefore, this morning, I recommend it to His Holiness that the Seattle Ramos be closed, its members disbanded, its coffers emptied, and its lands be handed back to the Vatican. Its members are not fit for proper service to the church. Pope has agreed with my assistant, ass assessment and approved my recommendation. Therefore, the Seattle Ramos will close on November 1st. You have two weeks to pack your things and get your affairs in order. Thank you.